Hi, um, everyone. Yeah, uh, this this is our talk. Thank, thank you for coming. Welcome. Click click the button, Chris. Uh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Chris. This is Paris. Uh, we're going to be talking to you about making beautiful mobile apps. We, we'd love um, if you troll us on Twitter. Um, yes. Talk, uh, you can, not necessarily during the talk. We won't probably check it. No, but I'll fill my pants over it. So just uh, trolling. Okay. So um, um, we have this weird presentation style where we may look like we're in fact arguing with each other. We'll make it up as we go along. Uh, this, these are this, this is entirely expected and we'll continue doing this. Uh, you'll get used to it eventually, yeah, hopefully. Exactly. So before we start, we'd like to find out who you guys are. Uh, has anyone actually claimed to be a designer in here? Good. <laughs> oh, good. Well, exactly. it's, a it's a developer's conference. I know, so don't really expect designers to show so up. So we were hoping slash expecting this um, because we managed to... I don't actually know how this talk got accepted into a developer's conference. It's um, because it's open source, and as of yesterday, oh, Android, Android is actually again. open source again. Okay, Android fantastic. is officially an open source product again, which is good. Okay, so most of you would describe yourself as coders, hackers, engineers, some, uh, some, some combination variation of, of those. Both, yes. Maybe. Put your hands up. You, you, are, you are one of those. Fantastic. <laughs> we actually have an audience that we expected. Good. This is great. Okay. Um, so, so this talk, it's, it's mostly about design and application design, um, but we're... No, because this is an open source conference, we're going to talk about something <laughs> open source. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about Android. And there's also stuff that we made up. Uh, you'll need to spot what that is. We're not going to tell you what it is in advance. <laughs> we actually made up most of this. Just to tip. So. Uh, design is mostly made exactly. up. Exactly. Yeah, so it's, it's nothing, nothing. There is no code in this presentation. So you feel free to code your own thing and just ignore us if you want to. <laughs> okay. So we're not actually just going to jump through a bunch of design patterns uh, because that would be dull. Uh, we're going to try and sort of give you a bit of context around why things are such in the world of mobile, Android, and design in general. That said, this is actually a bit of a survey of design patterns occasionally, so please forgive us. It really is a good way to get to grips with the Android platform in general. Okay. Yeah, and, and we're going to be talking about things. We have an agenda. Um, we're, we're going to be um, <coughs> firstly talking about mobile devices and what you can expect when you're developing for mobile devices. Exactly. Mobile um, devices. Good things. And, and then we're going to explain what, what it is when we mean design, when, when we say we're designing things, because it might not necessarily be entirely what you expect. Exactly. We're also going to try and attempt to convince you that you should probably bother with design, especially when it comes to mobile. Uh, mobile, sorry. Um, we're in Australia, Paris. I know, we're in yes. Australia, that's right. Uh, mobile, mobile, same thing. Uh, we're going to tell you why you should bother with design, especially on mobile. Uh, and, th and then we're going to explain what sort of people uh, use mobile devices and mobile applications and why they're exceedingly stupid. Yes, very stupid. Uh, and then we're going to talk about user experience and how you can fit into this and how you're hopefully not stupid. So our, our hopefully not too contrived example that we may occasionally remember to thread through this presentation is a conference app. And thankfully this has already been done once by the guy doing the phone gap talk, so I'm really pleased somebody else came up with a really contrived idea and it actually worked really well. We're not actually going to be building an app like he did. Um, yeah, so, so what would you consider putting into a conference app? All yeah, these things, things, everything. Like... You put Twitter feeds, you put photos, you put slides, you put attendee locators, you put coffee locators, you put everything, wouldn't you, Chris? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. I think you should put absolutely everything you can think that is relevant to an application. Into... All the things in the application. Oh. No, no, that's far too much stuff and we can't do that. Okay, um, so basically if you didn't get it already, you don't want to put too much stuff in a mobile app and we're going to try and help you uh, understand how to figure out what you should put in what to include, how to include it, and why you should include specific things. And, and you, as an open source user, have probably heard this far, far, far too many times. Um, or somebody saying something similar. Just give an expression on somebody's face that says this. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, design is frequently a matter of opinion when it, um, when it all boils down to it. And having a clear design is a is a matter of having clear goals about what you want your app to achieve and how you want to achieve it. Um, and when it and comes when to you're, you know, producing a, an app by something written by Google, um, Google you know, they, they don't necessarily sometimes. have a, a reputation for having strong opinions. Everyone's seen this things. before? This is fairly famous in terms of Google design. They, they tested a bunch of blues and then came up with one that's apparently better than the others, even though they're all effectively the same thing. Uh, so Google often doesn't have the best reputation for products with a really great design sense. Uh, but hopefully Android is different, and Google itself is becoming different. So the guy who's currently running the Android user experience team, he also actually designed WebOS, the, the Palm slash HP project, which has a reputation for great design, and he has some good things to say about design, in that he thinks that design should be a thing that people can define on their own when they're building something, and as long as they're sort of good citizens of the platform, they can have a huge variety of looks. Um, and what this means is that you can be a smug git while developing for Android. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So let's have a quick chat about actual devices. Now, how do you have 
an Android device. Does anyone have an iPhone? <laughs> Right. Well, like that's so. timidly Let's go. Right. So, so, we're, so for you people who own iPhones, we're, we're going to tell you something you might not necessarily know about Android, and that's that there are you know many many devices for for Android. There's a huge there, variety. There are of phones, devices. there are tablets, there are you know, portable There's media pad players, uh, and, and you know toasters and dishwashers and microwave ovens that is indeed running Android. That's real. You can buy that. So, um, so a Android, Android comes in many different form factors, and you can't necessarily expect uh, your hardware to have a given form or a given set of capabilities. Some things have hardware keyboards, they have hardware track uh, trackballs. Some just have a touch screen. You can have mice. You can have tracking pointers, toasters with mice. Yes. Yeah, so some things have 40, 40 key keyboards. Some things have twelve key keyboards. The, the, the variations are basically endless. Uh, and then you have the whole issue of lots and lots of different screen sizes and different expectations of how users are going to interact with devices of different sizes. Um, you, know, you can have theoretically any size screen device when you're developing for Android. Uh, and conveniently, Google have made it so you only really have to target four different, uh, four different types of screen sizes. They've abstracted away the precise size of screens. And, and so, you know, you get this provided to you in the SDK, so you can tell whether or not you have a small screen or an extra large screen. <laughs> Why the you dirty, childish? dirty people. <laughs> um, and then, luckily, there's nothing you can figure out from that. If you can figure out what that means, you know, you're, you're doing really, really so well. So we've, we've helped um, created this table for you. Yes, so this table tells you uh, what sort of pixel densities you can have. And once again, they've abstracted that down to four. So you only really have to deal with four different uh, pixel densities and four different screen sizes, which means you have up to 16 different types of screens on Android. And luckily, not all of these 16 are completely, um, are completely frequent. You know, they tend to cluster around the diagonal. And there's the, as we get towards the future, the clustering sort of goes to the corner, which you know, is important to remember. Because this basically affects absolutely everything. Uh, when you're thinking of an Android app, you need to think about the potential different screen sizes in terms of whether you're wireframing, whether you're drawing the app on paper, which we'll come to later, and you absolutely should be doing that, or whether you're actually building the app. The screen size affects everything. Uh, and, and another thing that changes with Android is the expected ways of, of presenting an app to a user. Um, back in the old days of Android, we expected hardware keyboards, we expected menu buttons. Um, menu buttons are disappearing in Android uh, starting with version 4. And, uh, and they're replacing it with different methods of navigating applications. And you need to keep up with these to make sure your apps seem modern and behave as users expect. Trackballs used to be part of the spec as well. And while you can still have them on the device, they're basically gone from most consumer devices as well. Hmm. OK, so another thing you have to be aware of, and this is a very typical Google style, is the documentation is wildly inconsistent, uh, con contradicts itself, and is confusing. Uh, it talks about things that don't exist anymore. It talks about things that don't exist yet and it makes things up that don't actually exist at all. So beware of the documentation, because Google's basically trying to troll you when they present what they laughingly call the Android documentation. When um, it's good, it is good, but half the time it has things that don't even make sense. Uh, yeah, quite frequently you'll notice things that have appeared in more recent versions of Android. Uh, a good example of these are UI fragments, which appeared in Honeycomb, which allow you to define different bits of user interface in a reusable fashion. Uh, these were decided to be a very important part of Android development, and so got backported. So the documentation says it's only available from version three, but there are but there are compatibility libraries that allow you to use it in back to version one point six, uh, though the API says it's not going to be available to you. So you do really need to keep keep abreast of of what changes are happening um, and, and what <coughs> Google is making available to you. And one of the best ways of doing that is to look at the Google Android Developer Blog, which is kind of a good substitute for the actual documentation, because they tend to post articles there describing all the new stuff. And then, I don't know what happens, but they forget to put it in the documentation and then leave it in the blog for a few years. So, yeah. So, skip the blog and actually read the blog. Because use search, don't use, don't use the documentation directly. Yes. Okay. So, some tenets of Android app design that Google sort of puts forth in a variety of places. And again, these are not in a consistent single location. And they have to be collected and sort of analyzed. <coughs> First one we're going to look at is clear versus simple. Clear versus simple basically means that Google recommends that when you're designing an Android app, you should favor something being really clear over something being simple. And um, people have a really strong tendency to think these are the same thing. Uh, but, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, you can have lots of functionality within an application, but provided it's presented in a clear way that, I'm sorry, that users can 
uh, can see easily, then um, then this is far easier or far more sensible to a user than reducing all the functionality in an app and just presenting it like they're idiots. Which is kind of what some people assume our mobile design means. Another thing they suggest is you should be consistent yet engaging. And this basically means feel free to take all the built-in widgets and stuff that our Android provides you and tweak them if you want to make them more engaging, as long as you use them in a relatively consistent manner. This is a bit different from iPhone land or perhaps other toolkits you may have used because they sort of often encourage you not to change the default look or behavior or something. Android says that's kind of okay as long as people can intuit what's going on. Along the same lines as elegant variation, which basically says vary things in a, in a nice, elegant manner. This is a bit nebulous, and it probably is a bit nebulous, that's, that's okay. You'll, you'll hopefully come to understand as we get further in. Uh, one thing that's a bit more concrete, though, is this idea of content versus Chrome. Um, you've used to do with the browser. You've all used the web, app, the web browser on the Android device. Not the web browser called Chrome, but you know, the Android web browser. Um, you have the URL bar that sits at the very, very top of a view, but when you scroll down, the URL bar gets obscured from view. Right? So you're not keeping the URL bar in focus all the time. You're focusing on the content. This can be contrasted with, say, a desktop web browser where the URL bar stays in view all the time. Another quick one we would like to mention is enhanced by cloud. You may not think this is a design thing, but it really is a design thing. Google, when you're thinking about Android apps, they strongly recommend that you push as much to the cloud as possible and preserve your state to the cloud. Um, if a user gets a new device, they want to be able to pick up where they left off on the previous device. And the toolkit makes it very easy to do this, and this, while it may sound like a programming thing, is very much a design thing. Along the same lines as maintaining context, which doesn't necessarily have to rely on the cloud to be true. If you take a phone call while using your app, you want to be able to come back to your app in the same place it was uh, without losing data, without being confused. Um, so people who have developed desktop applications tend to think of, uh, of writing programs <coughs> as having effectively a single entry point. Um, whereas with, with Android, there are multiple different ways that a user can get access to your app. They can launch it from a, a launcher bar, uh, they can uh, open a particular piece of content from a widget, uh, they can have content shared to it from other applications. Uh, so this really lends uh, Android design to um, designing a whole bunch of loosely, uh, loosely coupled components that can have a particular flow but have lots and lots of uh, well-defined entry points that function well independently <coughs> of each other. This can be contra or th this can seem something like uh, web development, for example, where you can have lots of pages or people can hotlink images or JavaScript <coughs> elements from other sites. You know, bits of functionality that behave independently well of each other that can still be coherent. Thinking about your app as bits of functionality that behave independently uh, of each other but are still coherent is a really good way of thinking about mobile app design. Uh, Google liked this idea so much, they're in fact porting the idea of the intents, which is the, the feature of the SDK that makes it possible to the web, and web intents is something similar that you do on the web. Okay, so just to summarize what we've just talked about in the first section, we've tell, told you you need to know your device, and by device I mean devices. Because you know, so there are know. lots of them in Android. Exactly. Heaps. So that means know the dimensions, the sensors, the possibilities, and import screens, and so on. Uh, and, and you should also know the characteristics of your platform, how your platform, in this case we're talking about Android, but if you're developing for any other platform, so knowing specifically how your platform does things. Yes, you're not making a cross-platform app even if you are. Mm. Okay, uh, so now we're going to talk about what it is we mean when we talk about design for, for applications. Um, when you saw the title of this talk, which said, Making Beautiful Android Apps, you thought, okay, uh, let's make something with lots of pretty colors, with custom elements and things like that. But when it all boils down to it, designing <laughs> applications is not all about pixels. <coughs> no, uh, pixels do help, though, but it's yeah. not about pixels. No, it's, it's rather about leading, leading users to where they want to be and helping them achieve tasks that they want to Exactly. Do. So if you're, if you're sitting there and thinking, I've never used Photoshop or whatever particular tool you like using, I've never designed an interface and couldn't design an interface to save my life, that's fine. Uh, designing a mobile app is more than just pixels. It's about placing things on the screen in an effective location and carefully considering how much stuff you actually present to the user and allowing the user to expose the intent that they want to achieve with your app really quickly and get the feedback that that has been accomplished for them as fast as possible. So in that sense, design really is not optional. When it comes to mobile, because you've got such limited screen real estate and you're competing for users' attention, as we'll talk about soon, that basically design ends up being how the thing works. Ooh, that was a seg from three of the slides, that was good. Uh, design is how the thing works, and you may have heard of this bloke, he says a lot of interesting things in the past. Hmm. It's pretty cool. 
Okay. Um, yeah, so, so when you think about designing an, an app for mobile, um, you're more considering about what a user needs to be able to accomplish in their app. And good design for a mobile app is about meeting the expectations of the user. They, they download apps to solve a particular problem, to, uh, to suit a particular purpose. And it's your job to meet those expectations that they have. Um, and that answers the question on this slide. Oh, let's not talk um, about cool, let's get that section. Fine. Done. <laughs> ah. Okay, let's talk about traits of the mobile user. As we mentioned, mobile users are really stupid creatures. Hmm. They're fickle, which means because they have access to this app marketplace, these app stores, and can quickly <coughs> change whatever it is they're using to something completely different, they're liable to do so at a moment's notice. So if you bore them, displease them, confuse them, or otherwise anger them, they'll just go and get another app and use something different. No, and, and people, when they're using their mobile devices, it's very, very frequently they're just pulling it out of their pockets idly while they're not doing anything else in particular. They're, they're not specifically going out of their way to use your applications, whereas they might be on, on a desktop device. Exactly. They could also be distracted. They could be using their phone in the middle of a presentation. Think uh, <laughs> <laughs> that intentionally. I know. I know. Uh, so they could be distracted with something else. There's a million other things going on while they're using these devices, so they don't want to have to think about how the interface works. They don't want to have to figure out how the interface works, and they want to get something done straight away. They could also equally be confused. As is another example of the gentleman at the front, uh, and not actually know where they are, what's going on, or who they are. <laughs> sounds pretty accurate. That's usually my case. Yeah. Um, and they, they might be doing other things at the same time, like multitasking, using their, using their phone while they're driving, uh, while they're while they're talking to somebody on the phone, while they're being hit by a bus. Yes. So basically mobile users are very, very stupid people because they take like a, a standard computer user and they've sort of been compressed and had all their intelligence extracted and they're also very, very, very distracted by everything. Hmm. So basically you need to remember this when you're designing that. People so, do not want to have to deal with multi toolbar monsters that have every functionality under the sun exposed to them. Uh, so, so now that we've talked about um, the people that use your apps. Now, now let's talk about about you and and how you can help make user experience uh, work. Exactly. So design is not magic. Um, I, I don't know why I put this picture in here to illustrate design not being magic. Design is not, in fact, magic. Design is meeting the user's expectations. That basically means if you are creating a mobile app, you need to think about what a user wants to accomplish with your app uh, at the specific moment they're using it, rather than thinking about all the possible features you could throw in. Uh, and a person who wrote a lot of, of very influential work on meeting the user's expectations, his name was Norman, uh, Donald Norman. Ron Norman. Uh, he came up with a, a bunch of interesting things in terms of how you should approach designing, designing interfaces for people. The design vocabulary that he sort of presents is as follows. And I'm just going to quickly jump through it. We'll mention the book, it sort of contains this at the end if you haven't heard of this before. Uh, but basically he says you need to think about visibility, which is how obvious it is something does something. Affordance, which is basically exposing the fact that something does something. Feedback, which is basically being really good at telling the user something is happening or has happened, or that what they've done has actually triggered something to happen. Mapping, which is basically what the user thinks something does. Uh, we'll come back to that later. Constraint, which is basically you know, the bounds in which they can make something happen. And consistency, which is if something does something once, it should do the same thing if you do the same thing again. Um, and, and, and with these sets of... of uh, of design, of, of words that you use to describe design in mind, um, you also need to keep in mind that the whole idea of mobile use is that people are trying to solve tasks. People want to be able to do particular things with your, with your phone. They want to take a picture, they want to make a call, they want to send an email. They don't sit down at their phone thinking, I'm going to use the phone now. They sit down with their phone thinking, I'm trying to catch a bus and I'm late and I want to check the cricket score. So it's so, not the same methodology. It's not the same use case as any any other piece of technology that they own. Yeah, and so when we come back to our, our idea of a conference app, um, you know, there, there's multiple use ask, cases here. We need to ask certain questions about how a user would go about using a uh, a conference app. So you know, we might want to check the schedule of the conference while we're at the conference. But what do we want to do before and after the conference? And can the conference app detect those cases and present different data accordingly? Because if you're checking your conference app after a conference, it probably means you want to refer to something. You probably don't necessarily want the app to pin itself to the very last day of the conference and make you scroll back to the Monday if that's what you want to look at. So there's a lot of context you can pull and sort of make it easier for the user to find what they want. And, and, and so when you're thinking about using mobile applications, uh, you need to come up, you, you need to make the operations that are going to be common very, very easy. And this can change 
uh, with the context of which people are using their apps. People are going to interact with a Maps application differently when they're planning a route to get from one point to another than they will be if they're in a car driving, right? And you, you need to present, present the operations that a user is going to take in different ways under different contexts. The, the point here is you need to basically use all the relevant inputs, whether that be time, orientation of the phone, you know, lat long of the phone, anything to figure out the context in which something should happen. Uh, and and on, the, uh, on the point of making common operations easy, um, you need to consider what affordances your app provides. The affordance is basically the perception that something can be interacted with. These are two interesting examples of bad affordance from the real world. So, okay, people go to hotel rooms all the time, right? I mean, most of you are probably staying in a hotel at the moment. And one thing that hotels absolutely love to do is uh, put in really, really bizarre plumbing. Usually right? very expensive plumbing. Right, so here is a water spout over a bath in a hotel room. This is the whole, this, the whole thing. You can see there, the entire wall there. There is, there is no taps around this. this. You have to turn on the water by filling with that thing. So, so people are, see something that they think is familiar. You know, most people are going to have some sort of concept or idea of what a tap is. Exactly. Which means they think they know how to operate it, but in this case they don't. Which means they're going to spend even longer trying to figure out how to operate it because they're trying to play with perceptions that they already have as opposed to learning something completely blank. And, and operating phones is, is going to be very much the same. You know, apps behave in defined ways that users have expectations of. And if you break those expectations... Then the fickle, bored, disloyal user will go and download... It's going to be confused. Well, they'll download a different app <coughs> after getting confused and angry with you. And the one on the, the, one on the right is a, a normal door handle. With two handles, for some reason. Mm. It's very odd. Okay. So another, another great example of this, which is one of my favorite examples, and we won't go for too long on this, but it's basically, this is the cover for a petrol cap, and it's one of those really annoying doors where you have to push it in some random location so it flips open. I push it there. On a hinge that is completely invisible. So this basically doesn't tell you where it pivots, and because of that, it doesn't sort of afford pushing. So you, you need to know where to push it to be able to open it. It doesn't tell you where to push it. There's nothing obvious that tells you how to push it. So the, the, Huh? <laughs> <laughs> An infuriating feature. So basically, be visible. Make sure there are strong cues between the design of your app, or in the, case, in the case of these objects, the design of your object, and its actual operation. And this is actually harder than it sounds, because when you're thinking mobile, you're thinking, I want to get something done. You're not thinking, I want to figure out how this works, which might be the case with a piece of desktop software. So mm. please, please be visible. And, and, and on that note, when you're designing for a system which is effectively task-driven, in this case mobile, um, what you're trying to do is allow users to accomplish goals, which means you need to think in terms of, of the abilities that your app affords a user as opposed to what sort of features you're going to add in the next release of your software. But they think in context of getting something done, as so, we've said over and over again, they think I want to get somewhere quickly while I'm driving, I want to manipulate this photo I just took. They don't think I'm going to open the photo manipulation app and open the photo I just took. They think I've got a photo and I want to edit it. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different way of thinking about sort of the features, the abilities of your program mm -hmm. as compared to other platforms. And, and so when you think about uh, affording abilities to users, uh, this means that you need to consider what sort of things a user wants to be able to do uh, when they're trying to accomplish a particular task. In this case, this means constraining the operations that your, that your user can see at any given time in such a way uh, that it's obvious to them what they need to do. You know, you should not need to provide complicated explanations uh, for, for how a user can accomplish something. And this is a diagram telling you how to operate a magazine. It's very easy to use. Yes, this is a real magazine, not a magazine app. Mm, real magazine. Yes. Um, and, and Google are particularly, uh, really particularly guilty of this. You know, when you update the Maps application on Android, you get this screen here, right? You're probably very familiar with it. It's great, it tells you all the new features that have changed since you used Maps, and once you dismiss it, you can't bring it back up. <laughs> it's thoroughly convenient. So you're told, you're expected to memorize all the new features that you might have missed beforehand, uh, and then you can't find out what they are again if you forget. And, and many apps do this. There's a, there's a great news reader called Pulse, which when you launch it, displays this overlay on top of the interface with arrows going everywhere telling you exactly how it works. The sad thing is the interface is actually really well designed and it's quite intuitable how to make it work, but they decide to annoy you with this thing before you can actually use it. So basically, don't put complex instructions on the screen. If something's not intuitable, you're doing something wrong. 
You, know, you should be able to figure out your application just by looking at the interface. If you're not, you're probably doing something completely, uh, completely incorrect. Okay, another really important trait of a good mobile app is being fault tolerant. This is a burden of arms, I don't know why it's there. Um, is being fault tolerant, and that means allowing for mistakes. Uh, the best apps allow you to do anything you like as long as you can undo it. So if you allow users to roll back anything, users start feeling really bulletproof when they use your app and explore it and use it more because they feel like they can't damage their data. Uh, so basically the easiest way to do that is make everything undoable. Sounds straightforward. Probably is more straightforward than you think. Uh, another important thing when you come to uh, designing user interfaces is that you want your app to be fast. Yes. You want instantaneous feedback to your user when a user tries to accomplish a um, accomplish something on your app. There's a lot of research about being fast. Uh, you should probably click that one. Oh yeah. Uh, there's a lot of research about being fast, <laughs> and basically the data tends to say that when people are using an app. They care a lot more about speed when it's a mobile app, simply because of the, the traits we mentioned before, you know, bored, confused, hit by yes. bus, so on. Yes. So basically, you need to be fast. And if you can't actually be fast, then you should probably just pretend to be fast. Yeah, pretending to be fast is actually a really, really clever trick that you should, that you should really know how to do when you're writing applications. Um, this is things like, um, like presenting the results of an operation on your app before an operation even succeeds. Like, for example, in a Twitter application, putting a, uh, putting a tweet into the timeline after you've sent it, but not necessarily after it's finished sending. This means that the user gets instantaneous feedback that something's happened. And then you can present an error later on if an error actually does happen. Um, and this means that you know, the user doesn't get held up while they're, while they're doing something and they think that the app is really snappy and responsive. And this is especially important if they're actually on a really bad network uh, because you know most mobile networks, really even really fast ones, are actually really terrible networks hmm. and you right. need to think carefully about this when you're designing a mobile app. Net networks really, really do, really, really do suck. Uh, but your applications are expected to work regardless of whether or not the network is working, even if your app depends on network state. Um, so this means that you should do things like cache as much data as possible so that your app can function in an offline state. Um, you know, people will give different affordances to different sorts of apps. You know, people have a long experience with web browsers where they had crappy dropping out dial-up connections. So you know, they'll, they know that they have to hit refresh when something is, is not happening all the time. Whereas people expect apps uh, in a native sense to behave responsibly and not behave like they're on a crappy connection which means that people will blame your app as opposed to the network, so, so think even about, if your network's failing. Think about how annoyed you get when you're sitting there looking at an app and it's spinning at you while it's doing something, versus how annoyed you get when the web browser's just calling you It's a completely different type of feeling. So you're criticizing the app uh, when you think about how slow it is, where slow, even if it's the network's fault. And it's unfortunately up to the app developer to make sure people don't have that feeling, even if they are on both of them. Um, so, uh, let's talk about how you can start making your, your apps have better user experience um, and, and how you can go about designing your apps to be better. Exactly. There's a great place to start. And that's the beginning. The first launch of your app. Um, at the first launch of an app, people usually have three specific questions. Where am I? That's, that's the first question. So they ask where they are. They want to know what, where they are and then the context of where they are. And then the follow-up questions are quite similar. They are, what can I do here and what else can I do here? And a great way to... Uh, to answer this question efficiently is to borrow from you know, some of the Android design paradigms that are becoming popular. So this is one that you've probably seen in a lot of applications. Uh, it shows up in Facebook, it shows up in Google+. It's called a dashboard and it presents all of the, all of the functionality that you can reach within an app uh, on the first screen when you launch it. This is an Android specific thing, but in general it's a great idea to be able to present all the different possible options for abilities that a user has when they launch your app as quickly as possible. And if they sort of understand the context of your app as soon as they launch it, then they'll probably dive deeper and use it more. Hmm. Another thing you can do that's really important is to minimize the conceptual models. Uh, and one question you might be asking is, what on earth do we mean by conceptual models? Oh, well, conceptual oh, can models, you answer that? I can. Oh, that'd be fantastic. We mentioned mapping earlier. So a conceptual model is basically a model of a system, i.e. a mapping, that a user builds in their head when they start using it. So you know, when I pull this lever, Chris gets electrocuted. That's, that's a mapping, and that's a conceptual model. And users have certain expectations as to what happens when they press buttons that look, in, look certain ways. So, so, so what, what you're saying is that, that users have preconceived opinions of what their phone is going to do when they, when they press something. You know, when they press a button, it's exactly. going to appear depressed and, and exactly. something happens. Has anyone got, used like Twitter for iPhone or Android with the pull to refresh and then got really annoyed when a different app doesn't have pull to refresh? Yeah, 
Because that's, that's that sort of thing. So right. people if, if expect user things a, to behave in a certain way. If a user has a pre-existing conceptual model, it's sometimes called a mental model of how something works, you really shouldn't break it unless you have a really good reason to. So Google really doesn't do this very well. So you shouldn't look to Google's apps for good examples of this. Because, for example, the manipulation of apps, so launching an app, finding an app, downloading an app, deleting an app, uh, moving an app to the SD card, they all happen in completely different locations on the OS. People think in terms of, of what things can I do to an app, uh, do to an app. Exactly. But the the way that you can get to the functionality of, of each of these all appear in completely different places. And this means you require a little more thought than necessary when you're actually handling an app. And it may not apply to people like us because we're probably all geeks. But when sort of <laughs> the standard phone user is using these phones, these things matter. Yeah. But, but even as coders, you, you have a, a really, really strong idea that it's good to couple um, you know, behavior that is related, uh, that, that deal with related concepts into you know, tightly coupled bits of functionality so that it's easy to find bits of code and, and easy, to, easy to, uh, ch to change things and, and, and add to it. Um, you know, concepts of OO apply equally well to, to design. Exactly. So another thing you need to remember uh, when you're building apps is that if you're building an Android app, you're not building an iPhone app. And you know, when we said that your know, iPhone has a monopoly on good design, what you need to do is correct people and tell them this. So the iPhone has a monopoly on iPhone design. Exactly. And there were a couple of good talks earlier about you know, Titanium and PhoneGap. These are platforms that allow you to build apps that run on iPhone, Android, Windows Phone, Blackberry, and so on. And they're great, but you need to remember that you're building apps for specific platforms, even if your code base is cross-platform. Yeah. And your, your Android apps really, really shouldn't look like their, their Apple apps. And you know, people do not want to use a, a Windows Phone 7 Metro app on their Android device. They want to use an Android app that looks and behaves like an Android Except app. Except maybe Nick. Except maybe Nick. Yeah. Okay. So um, we're going to take so a quick example, look at a bad example. So yeah, uh, here's an app. You know, um, one of these is running on Android. One of these is running on iPhone. And you know, if you did look at the very, very top of the screen, you could, you probably couldn't tell which one is which. And you know, we may think, why does this matter? Well, it, it matters. The, the tab bar does not go on the bottom on Android. You're breaking almost every user expectation by doing that. Hmm. The Android does not have a, a bar at the top that sort of has a stack which you navigate through. It's completely different. Uh, and, and you don't want users to start treating your Android app like an iPhone app. And, and users have expectations as to where different parts of the functionality in the app will be located. Android, Android users expect tab bars to be at the top. Right, exactly. and you know they're not there, and so they get confused because they've got to put their thumb somewhere different. So this is an app we're working on. This next one, basically, it's a, it's an example of how easy it is to make an app that looks native on both platforms. And one of these is definitely an Android app. And one of these is definitely an iPhone app. You can tell which one is which, right? Android app. <laughs> right. Obviously, if you laugh. That means you got the point. I, ideally, it will always be as simple as flipping the tab bars, but you know, most often it's not. Mm. Okay, a great way to make sure you actually design an app that is at home on the platform you're designing on, whether that platform be Android or Windows Phone 7 or, or iPhone, is to prototype. And the easiest way and cheapest way to prototype is to draw on paper. Thankfully, this is both cheap and convenient. I'm assuming most of you have used a pen before. Pens are just so fantastic awesome. new technology. It's like an iPad. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. But it's revolutionary. It's magical. Revolutionary. But drawing on, paper is, drawing on paper is a great way to sort of get a feel for your app. And you can even go so far as to sort of lay out all the possible options a user can take. And this is handy because Android sort of behaves like this internally as well. Yeah, you know, and Android does actually have you know, this whole stack-based navigation process you know, where you, uh, where you launch, uh, select an option and a new screen gets brought up and you can go back to it. And so you, know, you get a sort of tree-type tree type navigation. And this can be drawn really, really easily on paper and it's very, very easy to conceptualize the different ways in which a user can progress through your app it's also on cheap. paper. It's cheap. Once you've drawn out this app, you can actually hand this paper app to people. So if you have a very small notebook and draw each screen on a single page, you can hand this stack of pages to people and ask them what they think. And you can ask them what they think each screen does. You can ask them to use the app on the paper and you can get a lot of valuable feedback from it. Uh, this often surprises people because they think usability testing is some big complex procedure. It really doesn't have to be and probably shouldn't most of the time you'll actually get a lot of useful information if you just hand a paper app to people and ask them to use it. Uh, this and, is a and what's great is it's really not that difficult at all to get people <coughs> to, uh, to do usability testing. Um, to get really good usability testing, uh, you don't need that many people. Who here has five friends? <coughs> <laughs> Open source five friends. <laughs> right, so for that person up the back, you can make mobile apps because you know five people, and five people is basically all you need to be able to get good usability testing done. 
Who has a mother and a father? <laughs> it doesn't really matter who you ask. The point here is, this is a thing called heuristic analysis. It was pioneered by a guy called Nielsen. You can look him up. There's lots of criticism around this, but in general it works. Basically, How do you find the difference in a paper stack between a swisher shake and a you tell them, touch? Tell them. Right. Or put little so diagrams. There's a little uh, voiceover over the paper. Yeah. There's no, there's, you can, there's no reason you can't narrate, narrate the experience. And there's plenty of standardized uh, picture, pictorial representations of the different gestures and stuff. So. Hmm. So basically, yeah, you, you don't need a huge amount of people to actually get results. Yeah. And, and, and once you have results, you, know, you should actually analyze them and find out what they mean. Because having a whole bunch of results is not particularly useful unless you've actually thought about what they are. And, you know, we've tried a chart, that means this is loosely science, so yeah, you need to think about mm. it. Basically, come up with some personas based on your results, because people tend to fit into general specific groups when it comes to an app that has a specific set of functionality. So you can create these things called personas, which sort of say, user one might... Enjoys long, walk, thing. enjoys long walks down the beach. Exactly. Well, mm. Artificially lit beaches, isn't it? Oh, hello. That's my bio. Oh, right. Let's talk about me. So once you've sort of established these user goals uh, and what they mean to you, you can think about them in the context of your app. So if you think about your conference app we were talking about earlier, different users might want to get something different out of the app. So a person who wants to learn about mobile technologies might specifically want to filter the sessions to the ones that are based on mobile. And Rusty might want to know when he's talking. Exactly. That's handy. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and so basically, by thinking about it in the context of the different types of people, you can quickly pick and cull the abilities you're actually presenting your app. It's a good thing. So the sign is not, not stupid <coughs> at all. Oh, great. So I must use those next time. Exactly. Okay. Um, so we're getting towards the end of our talk now, and so we're going to touch on some various ideas that are specific to Android and how you might contrast these with other, um, other operating systems for, for mobile and other platforms. Uh, the first thing that, you know, as a mobile user, we're dealing with a we're dealing with an environment that's pr primarily driven by uh, touch interaction, right? And you know, you might think this is exactly the same on any system, but but it's not. Uh, these are the these are the different types of gestures that you can make on an Android device, and they all have well-defined meanings. Has an iPhone user ever used tap and hold? Maybe people have got an iPhone. So no, no. So Android users have used tap and hold. Yep, everyone's used tap and hold. So tap and hold does not exist on any other touch platform that I know of. It's a completely different thing for Android only. Hmm. And, you know, double tap, zooming in, means a certain thing on some platforms. It doesn't do that on other platforms. These are the fundamental gestures that you really should not play with. Again, don't break the user's conceptual model of how these things work. Very often when people are porting their apps from iPhone in particular, um, they don't necessarily... Uh, they don't necessarily know about tap and hold as a particular uh, you know, as a you, particular you, you, paradigm. You would be shot for offending Steve if you use tap and hold on an iPhone app, but on an Android app, it's probably a good idea for some for some uh, cases. Uh, and and on another note, dialog boxes really really suck. Um, when a dialog box pops up, most of the functionality of an app is completely disabled or blocked from you actually doing. And the problem with dialog boxes is that they completely override the uh, the user's attention. And you know you can't continue. Doing what I was doing. What was yeah, it? you're talking about dialog boxes. Oh, okay. yeah. when, a, when a dialog box is being displayed, basically nothing else can happen, and it usually isn't a good idea to do this. So please do not use dialog boxes. Um, along the same lines, being modal also sucks. Dialog boxes are modal, but they're not the only way of being modal. If you feel like taking over the screen, just don't. Um, no. well, on that note, there are certain cases where you know you need to completely um, take over a user's attention. Like if some massive error has happened, uh, or if there's something where your app just cannot continue without a user making decision, being modal is a good idea. But normally, you don't want to completely interrupt a user's flow while they're doing something because you know they have limited attention spans while they're using mobile applications. Exactly, and there's still far too many apps that throw up this middle of the screen box with the spinner in it that says loading. When they could really just stick a thing in the in the table view that they're displaying and say loading there it's again Twitter with the pull to refresh just adds a cell to the top that says loading rather than putting this thing in the middle of the screen that says loading mm. and there's still far too many apps that don't do it properly. It's far too easy to write dialog boxes in Android. It took me thirty seconds to make that one, yes. uh, so it's easy to do. But because it's easy, it doesn't mean it's good. So just don't do, do it. it. Yeah. Uh, on that note, another piece of, of <laughs> um, Another piece of functionality that somehow made it into Android is the context menu, you know, which is where like, on a list of items you tap and hold a particular item and then a list of options comes up. So it takes you about you know, a second or two to find the particular piece of 
of data in the list that you want to tap and hold, and that takes another three seconds for the menu to come up. And while tap and hold is a good gesture and belongs to the Android platform, using tap and hold to conceal functionality which is not available anywhere else is a bad idea. So please do not use a context menu unless you have a really good reason. Perhaps the only really good reason it is, is if there is functionality that you think an advanced user might want, uh, but most users wouldn't. It's, context menus are really undiscoverable and users won't one, you know, they won't enjoy using features that take them three seconds to get to because that's just not fast. Exactly. Uh, Next menu type is the options menu. Now this is Android prior to 4.0 only. So when you press the menu button and a whole bunch of options appear at the bottom of your screen, um, this is something that's very, very, well, that, that was definitely part of Android and an important part of the experience in the past, but it started disappearing as of about version 3.0 in favour of menus that you, know, you can press in the top right hand corner of your screen appearing in the action bar. If you weren't aware, the menu button is gone from the future Android yeah. devices. No it. menu buttons in, in Android 4.0 and instead all your menus appear, uh, appear up in the action bar. Um, so the, that, the API is exactly the yeah. same as, as it was for the old style options menu, but things are going to be presented differently and you need to consider different types of options <coughs> because the same set of options are not going to appear in the same way anymore. The things that tend to frequently appear in an options menu and perhaps appear in the action bar as well are things that edit the state of the current screen. So if you want to allow the user to edit content on the current screen, a good place to put that is the options menu. And sometimes a good place to put that is the action bar. The, contact, uh, the contacts app is a really good the example of, of seeing how the options menu should be used. Yes. Mm. Okay, so just the action bar is something we've mentioned a few times. <coughs> I'm sure many of you have seen an action bar. Action bar is the thing at the top of the screen here. Prior to Android 4.0, there were about 50 different action bar implementations. With Android 4.0, it's actually part of the OS and is now an encouraged thing you should be using. Uh, on that note, it's, um, it is in Android 4.0 as a native thing, but it's been backported in a compatibility library. So devices running 1.6 <coughs> and later have this native action bar available to them now. And this is absolutely the way that you should be developing Definitely. your apps. This is one of those things that shows up in the developer blog, but not in the documentation. And the documentation still says version 4.0 only, which so is wrong. An action bar is a great way of giving the user access to contextual things. Uh, so next slide, please. Ooh, contextual things. Contextual like things. So uh, in, in this case, I really like the Twitter app, and it's a great example of a really well-executed Android app. On the left screen, there's a button in the top right-hand corner which creates a new tweet. Uh, on the right screen, you have it into a specific user's profile, and you can now reply to that user instead of creating a new tweet. So it's just the similar action, but it's contextual to the thing that's happening. And that's what action bars are for. Hmm. So jumping quickly back to our conference app, uh, if it wasn't obvious by now, you probably only need a handful of features to actually make it a good app. You just need the ones that that only your app can go about providing. Things like the conference schedule, uh, where the venues are, uh, links to maps and things. And, and everything else can be provided by other apps. And if, you're, and if you deal with apps that are designed as loosely coupled bits of functionality, you can link into a Twitter stream for an app. So making a Twitter client for a conference is a pretty silly idea. Exactly. Whether apps have intents that you can get to. So just designing for features that you yourself can, that you, you yourself can provide and no one else does is a good idea. So, you know, they're probably even a coffee app that provides intents that you can access, mm. thus launching the coffee app. And the reason Maps is not actually a thing we've listed as something you should, you know, use intents for is because it's probably a good practice to actually embed Maps in your application and customize them with your own like, pins and such. Like have, have views that are part Maps, part not Maps. Yes. I don't need to take up your whole screen, whereas the Maps app will. Okay, so some parting words. If there's nothing else you take away from this presentation, these are the things we'd like you to take away. Um, users uh, are interacting with your apps uh, using touch. You're probably used to people... The picture has no relevance. <laughs> it's just, it's just was. Yeah. It's cool. Um, so, yeah, people are interacting with your apps using touch. Uh, and this means that they're... Using fingers. No. Fingers, yes, right. So people are used to using mice and mouse pointers, and mouse pointers, and you get one pixel accuracy with a mouse pointer, right? With a finger or a thumb, you're lucky if you can hit somewhere within a 40 pixel radius on most devices. So a good rule of thumb is 44 pixels Aha. by 44 pixels. Haha, <laughs> rule of thumb. Yes. Uh, as the minimum size for something you expect users to actually tap on. But you know, there are some Android devices like uh, Adams, which has a uh, which has a touchpad and a cursor. Exactly. So yeah, people are mostly using touch. Hmm. Now, as far as OS versions go, unless you're crazy, only target Android 2.1 and above. There's really no good reason anymore to target anything older than that. And hopefully, you know, within a year, there'll be no good reason to target anything older than 3. 
Hopefully. Hopefully. But, you know, we can't count on that. And please, when you're building your personal projects, incorporate design, you know, prototype them with paper, test them with people, storyboard them out, and actually think about how they flow together. <coughs> Because when you know when it's all said and done, a personal project when you put it away and come back to it after six months, you know you completely forget what you're doing, how how your project works, and you know that means you're just as bad as a new user in terms of being able to use your own project. So even I'm if, sure you you've had an experience like that. So even if you're completely antisocial and never intend to deploy anything to the marketplace, just think of yourself in six months, mm -hmm. please. And please read this book. This is by Donald Norman. This is a great book. It's starting to do with interfaces and design. It's about taps. And, Kettles and all sorts of interesting things. It's a really, really good book just to give you a handle on how, how things should work. Uh, and one thing that Norman said was this. Because if a mistake is possible, someone will actually make it. So if you can't make all the mistakes impossible, at least reduce the consequences of the mistakes. Hmm. Uh, this is the only time that this particular code name will be mentioned in this presentation. Uh, Android ver version 4.0, uh, it's not just coming, it's out. The SDK is out for it. The source code dump has been made, which means that all of you will be running CyanogenMod with version 4.0 on your HTC G1s within a week. Please right? don't do that. No. Um, but yes. But yes, you, you'll all be using um, you'll all be using Ice Cream Sandwich within the next um, within the next couple of months. And the gist which of this that your apps really do start need to really do need to start targeting it and taking advantage of the new design paradigms that have come with it. Things like the action bar the moved menus and things. So the gist of this is basically if you're making an Android app and they've either just started development or about to, then if you're not considering Ice Cream Sandwich, you're making a huge mistake. Right, so now let's talk about Android 4.0 from now on again. Okay. Cool. No more Ice Cream Sandwiches. Cool. cool. Right, so we're towards the end of the talk now. And the one thing, the absolute one thing that we'd like you to take away is that mobile is an enabler of contextual tasks. Uh, so you need to think about the relationship people have with these devices and how to actually make it less consuming of their attention uh, and more of an enabler of getting stuff done. And in that sense, design is definitely not optional at all, and you should use it all the time. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, we're at the end of the talk now. The slides will be there soon. soon. Um, and this link here, have, give us some comments, give us some feedback, give us a rating. We, we'd love to hear from you if you want to glimmer in completely anonymous. You tell us what needs more glimmer arms as well. Yes. Um, right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, questions? <coughs> Clinton. What sort of visual cues do you suggest for items which will react to a long press? Um, Up to you, as long as you're consistent I, within your app. The, the normal way to do it, if you look at buttons, for example, in uh, buttons on Android, where you press it, it will remain depressed. Um, Just be consistent. If, if it's going to respond to a long, a long press, it's, it's a matter of not giving feedback until the press is released, and that's the normal way of doing things. It's like the menu doesn't appear until you release from the process. <laughs> be consistent. The standard seems to be that um, if you press it, nothing happens, it won't design the long press. If you press it, then something happens after you press it. Oh, yeah. It's very helpful. That's, that's so many apps, you just kind of go, I wonder. Yeah. No. no. Yeah, so, so, you, <laughs> so you give feedback instantaneously if it's not for long presses. Um, but if it is for a long press. But you can't, because you don't know it's a long press until they long press. What is it? They figured it out. But nothing should nothing should ever be long press only. Um, but there, no, 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 no. You think, um, you know, there, there are things. there are action. I think there's an action listener for starting a press. There is. Yeah. yeah. But some things have to, you know yeah. short press works. Yeah. Well, short, short press. Well, short press presses work for everything. There is no feedback to say this is small. This is not long press. The only way to find it is stuff. It takes about the items on the screen that are short press and long press. You like tap and hold both. There's no other calls. Yeah. 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 Just be consistent within your own app. It's the best you can do. Because I, I, well, while I say that tap and hold is part of Android, it's, I don't think it's a good idea at all. So if you can avo avoid it, do so. But if you're using it, be consistent. Mm -hmm. I have the idea that they're moving away from tap and uh, tap long, long press. And they're trying. Yeah. They haven't. But you know, there's, there's far too many apps that still listen for long presses, which are just never going to get updated. So you know, they're stuck with it. Just because of the nature of Android, when they move away from something, it usually takes like four years. And you, you can move it. things like the, like the options menu, where they've provided a complete uh, functional replacement with an identical API. And so that's going to behave finely in version 4. But you know, things where the actual interaction model is, is fixed, you, know, you can't fix that easily. Uh, up the back. Do you see a way of um, phone gap and titanium and things like and, and 
layers like that, um, being able to adopt any of these design patterns? For sure. Yeah. Um, you've got a little bit more work to do, I think, in terms of making something yeah. that feels as good as a native app when you're using something like Titanium yeah. and Phone Gap. But the end result can definitely be just as good. It just puts more puts more uh, of the onus yeah. on the person who's building it. There's there's definitely nuances that you need to take into account when you're developing for each different each different system. Things do things differently, and you can't necessarily uh, in, uncover these without testing, uh, giving them to users on each platform and seeing whether they all make sense. Yeah. Anyone else? No questions. Great. I think we've told the audience everything they want to know. Yes. How did that tap work? Which what? How did the tap work? You turn the top oh, bottom yeah. of the tap. You rotate. You rotate the scout. It's <laughs> really. Yeah. This, this completely logical, isn't it? <laughs> right. Thank you. Right. Yes. Thanks.